we stroke the palms this way or this way, and it's called a palm omental reflex. Remember the thinker? Remember the, the famous statue or uh, sculpture of the thinker? What was the thinker doing? Resting his hand on his chin, right? And that thinker, this part of the chin is called the mentum. So this is a palmo-mental reflex. And what you actually see when that reflex is positive, you stroke that palm and you'll see their chin will lift. Okay? You stroke the palm and the chin will actually lift. It's a reflex. And it's a reflex that we see associated with changing the frontal lobes of the brain. All right? Thank you. That's another way that you can quickly assess. So turn to your friend, just stroke their palm, and look at their chin. You can't talk while you're doing it, of course. And if you know what they're looking for, also, you can't be sitting there thinking, oh, they're looking at my chin. <laughs> you're just smiling away, okay? The interesting thing is, when it's there, you'll see it. Just don't even tell them what you're going to do. Just go in to your loved one, just stroke your palm. And when you see that, that little quiver, it's a palm mental reflex. Okay? Let me write that down for everybody. Palm mental. Palm mental reflex. Can you do it to yourself? No, because you can't see your chin. Unless you looked in the mirror. In the mirror? And then you're, when you're looking in the mirror, you're giving yourself feedback to your eyes and you end up suppressing it. Okay? Best if you have somebody do it for you. Kind of fascinating, isn't it? So, again, if movement, emotion, and eye movements are key for health, then we can actually talk about what are some things that we can do to reduce our risk of frontal lobe demise. All right? Very first thing is movement. And I don't care if you call it exercise. I don't care if you call it walking. I don't care if you call it getting out, you've got to move. You've got to move your body. Movement and simply walking 30 minutes a day is one of the best things you can do to exercise your brain. Remember we've talked about in the past, a child learns at an exponential rate as they begin to crawl, walk, and run. And you think about the, the development of your children how quickly they learn language skills, how quickly they learn mathematical and reading skills as they're advancing in their abilities to move. That actually plays true even and holds true for us as adults. And that's one of the best things we can do. Now, we also talked about then emotions. The emotional area of the brain, though, is also healed by exercise. In the brain, they found, though, that there are specific proteins like the alpha nucleus antibodies and the Lewy body formations in the dementia, dementias and Alzheimer's, and those proteins that are actually detrimental to brain function build up all the time with thought. And they've actually proven now in research that one of the best things you can do for brain health is something that a lot of people already do. Fasting actually causes the brain to use those proteins that could potentially become detrimental to become now a source of energy in the brain. And it actually lights up an area that is right here, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the brain. Let me just write that out for us, okay? Dorso, lateral, prefrontal, cortex. This area of the brain has been proven to increase not only human connectedness, but also helps us to reach into realms, if you will, of connecting with a higher power, with God. I, I use the phrase God. If you're comfortable with that, great. If you don't like that phrase, a higher power, if you're comfortable with that. The fascinating thing about this is, though, fasting actually engages now in research 
the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the brain, which allows us to not only connect human to human, but in a much higher realm. Isn't that fascinating? And some religions and some uh, mental meditation and other practices utilize fasting as a regular practice to actually improve brain health. I think that's amazing. Okay? These same areas, though, can also be fed by the medium chain triglycerides found in coconut oil. And coconut oil MCTs actually stimulate a similar response in the brain to fasting. So for those who are diabetic, those who are hypoglycemic, who can't fast, we actually recommend medium chain triglycerides in coconut oil, and that actually helps to digest those proteins and make those potentially detrimental proteins into foods. All right? Again, fascinating. I think it's wonderful. And each day, I try to think for myself, have I fed my brain somehow today? Have I looked at something, studied something, have I read a scripture or something that's allowed my brain to think at a higher level? And then also, have I fed my brain something that has been beneficial to it? That's something I, I hope that we all do. Just consider your body. A lot of people say, oh, I went and exercised. Great. Wonderful. That's great for your physical body. What about your brain, though? What have you done to exercise your brain? Did you go for a walk? Have you fed your brain something like medium chain triglycerides? Actually feed it. Did you fast this month? Have you done something again to aid or benefit that brain? A question. I'm just wondering how much coconut oil you need to have. Yeah, great question. I'm going to let everybody sample this one. This one is it's a really tasty one. And I, I believe that uh, two teaspoons is adequate. Okay. But I, I often will do at least one tablespoon to two tablespoons. But two teaspoons. Do you use it in cooking or do you put it in like a smoothie? Or? I'd, I'd use it raw. I wouldn't cook with it. I'd, I'd actually use it either in a, a dressing or just put it into your smoothie raw. How often do you fast? Monthly. Once a month. Yeah. Yeah, God already re revealed that. I think Isaiah 58 is one of the best telltales about the promises of that. If you want to look in the Old Testament about the promises associated with fasting, it's just tremendous promises and tremendous blessings. Is there any other thing besides coconut oil that has those medium chain triglycerides? These are the best. These are the best researched. The, the medium chain triglycerides of coconut oil are, are the best researched right now and just have a great effect. And so I, I would use them. What about um, like from the actual coconut, like the coconut water and the coconut uh -huh. meat? Does yeah, those are all, all good. Is that the same as? No, the water doesn't have the, the same fats, the medium chain triglycerides that you're looking at with the oil. The, in the meat, you'll actually, it rings out and gives you then the coconut milk. And from that's where you're going to get a lot of those oils. Okay, but the water itself is just the water. Would Coconut's you... amazing uh, little plant, isn't it? And the little, uh, I guess we'd call it a seed of its own because it's just amazing what it can do. Well, the water's good for like your electrolytes. Very good. No, I'm not saying it's not good. I'm, I'm saying for this specifically, apple. yeah, the water's great. It's really good, especially... The raw foodists and the uh, people who are really into uh, healthy alternatives and even vegan diets, those who aren't will benefit though, and they tell that very strongly. Anybody else have a comment or question, please? Would, how much could you expect to see a reversal of disease? Great question. So the question right now is, can you see a reversal of Alzheimer's and uh, dementia? The answer is it's got to be person by person, because as the brain begins to atrophy, the only areas of the brain that I know of that can really become robust again is the hippocampus, okay? The hippocampus is an area inside of the insular cortex on the medial temporal lobe. Hippocampus actually means the seahorse, 
and it actually looks like a little seahorse in there. If you go online to uh, do a Google search and go Google Images, and under Google Images, if you'll enter Hippo, H-I-P-P-O, Campus, Atrophy, and then put in cortisol. You'll actually see an MRI study, and the nice thing about it is it, it actually shows on that medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, and there, nicely for us is there's a nice arrow pointing to it, okay, so you can find it quickly. What you'll see is atrophy of that area, you'll see a dark area, and they go in, change the person's lifestyle, and then use phosphorylated serine to dampen the cortisol effect and you'll actually see that area plump back up. So that's one of the few areas of the brain that I'm aware of that will actually rebuild itself when it's atrophied. All right? What and did one you of the most data? one of the most important things for protecting the hippocampus is something called phosphorylated serine. Phosphorylated Serine. Okay? Some places you'll read it as phos phosphatidyl. So P H O S P H phosphatidyl serine. And we carry that in a product called Adrena Calm, which you just apply topically, and it's very, very protective to the hippocampal areas of the brain. What does the hippocampus do? it links short-term memory to long-term memory. So it increases potentiation of short-term memory. And the hippocampus is best activated by activity, exercise. So if you really want a good memory, exercise. If you really want to maintain brain function, exercise. If you want to have longevity, with the ability to remember it, get out and do. All right. Whether again you call it exercise, walking, being active, you got to do something that's allowing that to be maintained. Now, here's something that's really interesting. In the female brain, there is a very strong desire to nurture. Right. In the male brain, not as big. That's why mom can get up in the middle of the night and go and check on the baby. And even when the baby's crying, she can go back. And even when she hasn't had any sleep, she still goes back. And then all of a sudden, she's pregnant again and has another one. And that frontal lobe is so strong and integrous that it makes her want to form a relationship with the child. Isn't that neat?